Today's passage, Luke 26, beginning in verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away from the cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, so do to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the words that Matt has read. Um, Thank you for for who you are. We don't require uh, great tech. We don't require everything to go well in in the morning service, Father, for you to be uh, worshipped and praised. What we require is a God who is holy and who is good and who is just and who loves us. We, We require a God like you and you have not only been our God, you have given us your son, you have given us your word so that we can understand how to properly live for you, Lord. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for who you are. Help us as we come to this very difficult passage. Help us to truly love the way that you have called us to love. Love others as Jesus himself has loved us. We ask all this in his name. Amen. The Sermon on the Plains, which is where we um, have been spending the last several Sundays, is a sermon about salvation. And what I mean by that is if, if we have truly come to know God, if he has saved us and we have been changed by God, uh, the words of Jesus here give us some guidance in, in what that should look like. Uh, you shouldn't come to know Christ. In fact, shouldn't is not the right word. You cannot come to Christ and be forgiven of your sins and uh, have your life look the same way that it looked before. Something has changed. And these words in this sermon give us some guidance of of what that should look like. Uh, Let me be very careful. I'm not saying that you do these things. You you love your enemies these ways. You, You refrain from judging the way that Jesus is going to go on later on. That is not what make you, that is not what makes you saved. You're not saved because you do these things. That is work-based salvation, which is not true salvation. But because you have been given a new heart, a cleansed heart, free from your sin, your life should begin to look more and more like this. I'd like to start, actually, by reading the last, um, uh, not not the very last verse in this passage, but Luke 6, 46, um, the verse that Jesus begins to uh, close this sermon with it's very straightforward Luke six forty six. he says why do you call me Lord Lord and do not do what I tell you we could paraphrase Jesus here with each of these statements that he makes through this why do you call me Lord Lord and not do what I say why do you do, call me Lord Lord and yet you do not love your enemies which is what he's talking about here in this section I would say let us not be a people who would call Jesus Lord, who would say he is our Savior, he has redeemed us of our sins, and not do what he says. And we come here, and as I said in my prayer, this is one of the most difficult passages, difficult teachings of Jesus, I think, to obey. It sounds simple, and as um, I I grew up in church, and as I grow up in church, I've, I've heard this message and similar messages over and over again, these words, love your enemies. It sounds great, but in actuality, it is extremely difficult. I'm okay with it in a con- as a concept, but what does that look like? How can I love an enemy? Well, 
It begins with knowing that God himself is love. And God loves us. It's why he has redeemed us. And because God is love and because he loves us, we then should love others. Um, but again, it's different from taking this at face value. It's easy to say, yeah, I'll love my enemies when I don't have very many enemies. It's harder to do when you encounter people who truly hate you, who truly despise you, who truly uh, do terrible things towards you or towards your loved ones. Maybe it's possible they do it, they, they wrong you on account of your relationship with God. Uh, the, the passage that Matt preached through this past Sunday, just back up to verse 22, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Maybe it's happening because we truly have been changed. And if, if that's the case, then uh, we should consider ourselves blessed. Jesus has said, Blessed are you when this happens. Uh, when we trust and follow God, the world will view us with the same hatred that it does for God. Um, so that could be one reason this happens, and in that case, love your enemies. It could also be that you were wronged by a fellow brother or sister in Christ, or maybe even a fellow family member. Whatever the reason, when we're in conflict with other people, when we're treated wrongly by them, this is prescriptive of what Jesus tells us we should do. This is how we should react. Not with, out of revenge, not out of hatred, but with love. So as we, as we get into this, I want you to pause for a moment and just ask yourself, who is Jesus saying that you should love? And who is Jesus saying that you should pray for and do good for and bless? Just take a moment and consider, is there a person maybe multiple people who have severely wronged you, who have hurt you, maybe somebody who hates you, possibly even somebody that you yourself hate, someone who has hurt you so much you couldn't imagine forgiving that person. The hard news here is that is the person or the people that Jesus is saying that we should love and pray for and bless. How do I treat somebody well who has hurt me like that or hurt a loved one of mine? How do I come to somebody with the love of God who has caused this deep turmoil, this pain? I would argue, uh, even in, in this particular passage, Jesus does not say forgive. I would argue that it begins with forgiving that person. He does have several other places, and there's other places in the New Testament will uh, we'll explore this morning where this message of love is, is joined with a message of forgiveness. We see throughout that scripture that we should forgive other people as God has forgiven us. But, but a question that comes up is, well, do we really forgive that person for, the, for this? I've, like, I've preached this passage before and other passages like it. Some of the passages I'm going to go through um, as, as they will highlight and several times I'm asked, yeah, but what about this person? You don't know what this person did. This person stole from me, who cheated me. This, this person betrayed me, hurt a loved one of mine, on and on and on. Verses 27 and 28 are, are clear here. Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. So how is it possible? And I'm going to start with um, Jesus' words here in the middle of the passage. And then we're going to back up and come back here to verses 27. Um, look at verse 32, 32 through 35. He says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those whom, uh, with whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. So, 
As I said at the beginning of this message, we are called to be different. If God has changed you, if he has saved you, you cannot go on living your life the same way because you are not the same person. He has made you different. One thing that is true about those that do not know Christ, uh, about sinners, of which we all were, about unbelievers, about people who reject God, is that when people love them, they tend to love those people back. So that is not the minimum bar that Jesus is setting. He, he says, what benefit is to you to do the same? He's saying that makes you no different than, than these sinners and these people that would reject God. If God has saved you from your sin, that means he's taken you from a place in your life when you were dead in your sins and where you were opposed to him in his holiness. He says that we are, the Bible tells us that we are at war with God. We, uh, we make ourselves enemies of God before we come to know him. And that is true if you uh, learn Christ, if, you, if he has drawn you to him as a child. It's true if he has drawn you to him as an adult. We had no way of repaying that debt of our sin. We deserve nothing but God's punishment for it. And yet God loved us. He sent Jesus into the world to live a perfect life and to die on the cross in our place. And when we believe in him and believe in that and ask him to forgive us of our sins, we are forgiven by that sacrifice he made on the cross. That's the gospel. But the gospel doesn't stop there. The gospel is not simply that I'm forgiven and that I get to be with, with God when I die. Um, there's more to it. If you have repented and believed, God has changed you. He's made you into a new person, a new creation. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So God has made us into something that we were not like before. He's made us more like him. He's made us into people that should hunger and thirst for his righteousness. People that are merciful, pure in heart. People that are peacemakers. These are uh, things that Jesus mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount, the companion sermon to this, uh, that are true of us if we become uh, believers in him. We are merciful and we are loving as he has, uh, just as he is. He goes on to say, in verses 18 and 19 of that 2 Corinthians passage, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So he's, he's caused us to grow into somebody that can forgive. It's not easy. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to tell us to do this. Um, he has loved the world and given us his son to die for our sins. And we must remember, we did not deserve his love. We did not deserve his mercy. We did not deserve this forgiveness. He says uh, there in 2 Corinthians, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're, we're taking the good news of Christ out into the world. He says that God is making his appeal through us. How can he make his appeal through people that are unloving if, if his message is uh, his love? Paul says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He's given us his righteousness, made us ambassadors, made us his witnesses out to the world. And if God makes his appeal through us, do you think that you can share his love and forgiveness if you do not display his love and forgiveness to people who do not deserve it? If he only showed that love to people that, I'm sorry, if he showed that love to people that hurt him and despised him, and he did, and if we were those very people at one point, how can we do any less? If we only love and forgive people that love us and treat us well, we're no different. And God has called us to be made different. He is sanctifying us. That's a big church word that means that he is making us holy, freeing us from our sin, and setting us apart from the world. The world is this way, then we must act this way. We must be different. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Unless we be proud, he then reminds us in verse 11, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, there's that word, set apart. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Son of our God. So my point in going to these two passages in Corinthians and starting in the middle of this section of, of the sermon is that we are called to be made different. And the good news is we're not told, make yourself different. But my point is that he, God has done the work in us and is doing the work in us, continually sanctifying us. But we're changed, we're loving, and we're forgiving. Because of that, back to, Jesus, back to this passage here, we should love those people that we would find unlovable. That is not only a good recommendation, that is being obedient to our Lord and Savior. Loving and forgiving someone, remember, doesn't mean that we're condoning the wrong that they may have done. I'm not talking about people that made a mistake, didn't mean to do something. We're, we're, that, that may be true as well. They've hurt you, but in many cases, we're forgiving, we're loving people that have truly done wrong. Jesus forgave me of my sins, and there were a lot of them. And not at any point did he say that any of them were okay. If they were okay, he wouldn't have had to die on the cross for them. So the person that hurts you or loved one that still hurts you, if you're showing them love, that does not mean you're telling them, oh, that, that's okay, you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe, maybe they did. And if they did, love them. And you should love them. And you should forgive them and not hold it against them. It's not a trump card that you pull out later and say, well, yeah, but you, you did this. You hurt me in this way. Because we're commanded to show the love and the mercy of God. And we did not deserve his love or his mercy. So let go of the hurt. Continue to forgive as the hurt's feelings dwell, swell up in you, and they will. And I understand, I've said it several times, that this is not an easy calling. This is not an easy thing to do. I wish that there were some formula that were made it possible to love our enemies in this way. And I'm not really a formula person when it comes to the word. I don't think follow these steps, follow these magical uh, things. But actually, Jesus has given us um, some pretty good information here. He says uh, back in verse 27, and we're now we're going back to the beginning. He tells us to love your enemies. Uh, but I say to you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. So loving your enemies, what does it look like? Well, actively love them. Plus, um, pray for them. Plus, do good to them. Plus, bless them. I think I got the order wrong because I missed where I was in my notes, but those are the four things he tells us. And we'll go through those here. Um, he says, I say to you who hear. The, it's like uh, where he said other places, those who have ears to hear. Uh, this type of love is not possible aside from somebody that has been saved, that has been changed by God. That's, that's first. That's why I started with that. That's your first step. Because it's easy to hear love your enemies and nearly impossible to actually do it. In fact, I don't think it's possible to love them this way apart from Jesus. So how do we do it? How do we love them? Um, by actively loving them. Um, some of you, this is going to resonate very strongly. Some of you that maybe are a little bit older or a little bit younger, maybe not so much. But back, back in the 90s, there was a great theologian and philosopher whose name was uh, Toby Mac uh, of DC Talk. And he put it this way. I'll try, I'll, for your listening pleasure, I will not wrap it. I will just read it. But pulling out my big black book... Because when I need a word to find, that's where I look. He means a dictionary. So I moved to the L's quick, fast, in a hurry, threw on my specs, thought my vision was blurry. I looked again, but to my dismay, it was black and white with no room for gray. You see, a big V stood beyond the word, and yo, that's when it hit me. But 
love is a verb. Love is a verb. It's an action. Yes, it's a noun. We can get into grammar later. <laughs> but in this context, love is a verb. Jesus says here to love your enemies and immediately says, do good to those who hate you. So that, that's how we love them. Not just, okay, yeah, I love them. I have, I have this great feeling. No, it, it's, it's harder than that. Do good for them. Do good things. Think of the loved ones in your life. Think about your wife, your husband, son, daughter, a friend, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. I go back to premarital counseling. I don't remember everything that we discussed in that, but I was taught in my marriage to treat love like a choice, like an action. And every day, no matter how I feel, I try to treat joy like I love her and then act that way. And when I do that, the emotions follow. Now, bear with me. This is an example. I'm not saying that joy is my enemy. And I hope that she doesn't feel like I am, especially after this example. Um, and that's all it is. But my love for her usually burns with the heat of a thousand suns. I know what you're saying. Yeah, I should write poetry. Um, but there are days maybe my love for her only burns with the heat of, say, nine or maybe ten suns. And on those days, if I do good things for her, loving things for her, actions, it helps rekindle that love until it's burning as bright as it should. So love your enemies, and how do we do that? By doing good things for them. Even the ones that hate you, especially the ones that hate you. The way we respond to persecution, to conflict, to people that are doing us wrong, should please Jesus, who has told us to act this way. When people direct evil towards you, direct good back towards them. And then let's make it a little bit harder. Verse 28, Jesus says to bless them. He says, bless those who curse you. Yes, even those that curse you, especially them. Blessing them is reflected in our speech. So, are you saying now I have to uh, be nice to them with my words? And that appears to be the case. Yes. This means the words that we say to the person. And that's, that's okay. I have an enemy, not very, very kind to me, very hateful towards me. I can go to their face and say nice things. But what do you say about them when they're not around? These are the words that we say about them as well. Speak well of them. Speak as well of them as you can. We're not condoning sin, but we're also not attacking them with our words. And this is something that I have struggled with, not attacking enemies with our words, because that means not even sarcastic words, no matter how funny I seem to think that they are at the time. Bear in mind, and I kind of allude to this, that blessing them does not prevent us from sharing hard truths in love. It does not mean saying that sin is okay. Remember last week's sermon, last week's passage. And immediately before this, Jesus shared many woes. He said, woe to the rich, woe to those who are full, woe to the proud who laugh. Um, he is pointing out things that are wrong, and then he goes in and tells them uh, to love people. Sometimes the most loving thing that you can do is share the truth. So this is not turning a blind eye to sin, but it is... Blessing people with our words. Blessing someone that curses us shows us that we are putting trust in God, not our circumstances. But Scott, the, the person I'm thinking about has been abusive verbally, physically, spiritually. Are you telling me that I have to love that person? And actually, no, I'm not. Jesus is telling us that we must love that person and do good for him or her and bless them. And then the next section is to pray for them. He says, pray for them. I would say pray for the ability to be obedient and to forgive and to love. Follow through on your prayers then. Do good things for them and bless them with your words. You see, prayer changes people and it changes circumstances because God answers prayers. Through praying for this enemy, God may change the person that you're praying for. Maybe it's a non-believer and they come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And praise God. We should be the first to rejoice when that happens. Maybe as a fellow believer and you have uh, resolved your relationship with them and been a better uh, example to the world. Whatever God does through your prayer for that person, 
he most certainly can and will change you through it as well. You see, prayer, I think here, is beneficial for the person that you're praying for. It's beneficial for you. Prayer protects you from bitterness. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit uh, teaches us how to pray when we don't know how to pray. It can be hard to pray for somebody that hates you. It can be hard to pray for somebody that you hate and that you know that you're told to love. It's also going to be hard to pray continually for that, to, uh, for that person and not be changed in your attitude towards them through what God is accomplishing in your prayers. And what about somebody that has hurt, that's, that's done true wrong? If somebody has done something harmful to you, do you allow them to continue to do that? Well, I, I would argue that forgiving and loving them does not mean unconditionally trusting them. There, there's room to be wise um, with our enemies. But at the same time, verse 29 Jesus says, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And this is talking about a literal insulting slap. Acting in love towards that person may prevent another attack, and it, and it may not. But what we shouldn't do is seek revenge. I had a grandmother that would remind us of Proverbs 20, 21, and 22. It's also a reference in, in the book of Romans it says, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. She didn't like that part of the verse very much, but she loved where it says, for you will keep burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. And it's true that when we respond with good, the world looks at us and realizes, well, uh, may realize, well, I could not react that way. Um, this must be something supernatural. That is one response to that. And that way we're heaping burning coals on the head. But we shouldn't seek revenge. I would say, while this entire verse is true, try to concentrate as much as you can on the giving of the bread and the giving of the water and less on maybe it will feel like burning coals on their, on their head. The Bible also does not prohibit self-defense or getting out of harm's way. We had a men's meeting yesterday and spoke about security in the church, preventing someone from... Uh, coming in here and harming those that would worship with us is a loving and God-honoring action. Getting out of harm's way is also not forbidden. I'm not going to read this, but in 1 Samuel 19, Saul tried to kill David. King Saul tried to kill David with a spear, and David got out of the way and fled. There's a story that was told to me. I think it's a joke. Um, I don't. It was told to me as a true story. I don't believe it. So is it... Um, with that in, in mind, it was about a, a pastor who was a former retired boxer that would go around from town to town preaching revivals. And as he was going to the revival one night, there were some uh, teenagers that wanted to teach him a lesson because they didn't want him in their town teaching that, that sin was wrong. And um, they came up to him, hit him so hard, he fell to the ground. And he got back up to his feet and he reached out his other cheek to them and they shrugged, and the guy hit him again, and he fell to the ground, and he got back up, cracked his knuckles, and said, the Lord has left me no further instructions. I think there is a place, and it is, it is okay at times to practice self-defense. But our first response should always be love. Our response should never be to retaliate, to seek out vengeance, to re seek out revenge. So if this means an insulting slap in the face, then yes, it does mean turn, turn the other cheek to that person. Um, and other forms of insult and injury should be dealt with the same way. Believers should be compassionate, not retaliatory. If they take your cloak, give them your tunic. If possible, take steps to be wise and not be hurt. But remember, Peter, in another passage, asked Jesus, well, how many times should I forgive a brother that sins against me? Seventy times. And Jesus said, no, not seventy, but seventy times seven. And while I think that Jesus here was making the point that we should just continue to forgive others without counting, if you insist on counting, the minimum bar there will be 490 times. Verse 30 here, Jesus says, to give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. Um, as believers and followers of Christ, washed and cleansed by his blood, we should help those who are 
truly in need. Give to the beggar. To the one that takes from you, don't demand it back. This ties into verse uh, 24 where Jesus talks about not lending only to someone because you know that you're going to receive it back. I remember in college I had a group of friends I, I was a part of. And all of us, including me, at time or to time, usually to go out to, um, to eat in the evenings. But from time to time, we would borrow money. I would borrow money from someone. Someone would borrow money from me. And we had a particular friend who just didn't have the same means that we did. And he borrowed more often than anybody and almost never paid it back. And we continued to, uh, for, fortunately, we ten, continued to lend back to him. Um, I think it showed love. Um, we are a church also here that loves God. We say we do, right? We love God. Hopefully that is true. When you love someone, you grow to love the things and the people that they love. I love Joy, and through her, I've grown to love her family as well. God loves people. He loves people so much that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so because of that, and because of our love for God, we are also a church that seeks to love people. <clears throat> not because we want something from them. We don't give and serve and hope to get something back from them. It's because we truly love. Verse 31, the golden rule, treat other people the way that you wish that you would be treated. This, along with loving the Lord your God, sums up the entire law. Jesus said in Matthew 7, this is also from the Sermon on the Mount, so whatever <clears throat> you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Have you ever wronged somebody or been in need of forgiveness? Would you want them to love you and to forgive you? Then do the same for them. These are hard truths, which is why Jesus calls salvation a narrow gate. He, he says to enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. And this brings us to where we started near the end of this passage, back to verses 32 through 34. Remember, Jesus says, what benefit is it if we only treat people like other unbelievers do, if we only love those that love us? Only doing good that, to those that treat us well. Here, a practical application here that he goes into is if someone is in need and asked to borrow, if you're able, give even if you think they won't repay you. What if I give somebody money and they never give it back? What if, what if somebody steals from me or ridicules me or picks on me or curses me? What if they truly despise, hate me, hurt me? Maybe worse, what if they do it to somebody that I care about? As a young pastor, um, pre preacher, I remember making these same arguments, um, saying that if someone were to hurt my wife or my child or my sister or my lover, uh, my mother, my, my dear friend, my um, um, on and on and on. I, I would hope that I would be able to make make the, make the sacrifice of, of, of loving that person. I hope that I would be able to pray and to forgive them. And since then, I've had a lot of this happen. Actually, I'm not I'm not sure that I've I've lent money that wasn't repaid, but I've had money <clears throat> that was rightfully mine taken away. I've been ridiculed. I've been hurt. And worse, I have had a dear dear loved one loved one be tragically hurt by somebody in a way that scarred them for life. What then? It's beyond difficult. Uh, in preparing for the sermon, uh, I realized that I'm still harboring hurt um, and, and perhaps hateful feelings towards some of these people. But Jesus didn't tell us to forgive them or to love them because they deserve it or because they treat us well. He says, forgive your enemies. Pray for those that abuse you. Pray for those that abuse others. We should love when it hurts to do so, and it does. And it hurt our Lord as well. That's why verse 35, your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. And this brings up a point, you know, what if they don't want your love? Well, he was kind, Jesus was kind to the ungrateful as well. This is the way he taught us to live by his life and his death. Verse 36, be, be merciful to those who do not deserve mercy because none of us deserve God's mercy. I came on alluding to the Sermon on the Mount 
Uh, like Matt, I believe these are probably two separate sermons uh, where Jesus goes into, uh, in, into some more detail. And in that sermon, he gives us the way to pray. And when he does, he says, uh, forgive us our, we, should, we should pray, forgive us our debts, or other translations, forgive us of our sins, as we have also forgiven those who sin against us. Aren't you glad that God forgives us based on his love and mercy and not our ability to forgive those who have sinned against us? Now, if we are to pray this way, how much more ought we to love and to forgive? Now, keeping on with this forgiveness thing, Colossians 3, verses 12 through 13, tells us, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Be compassionate. Kindness, humility. Put on meekness and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. And here's how he says we should forgive. Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You want me to forgive so-and-so? You don't know this person. You don't know how hateful, how unworthy, how evil this person is. And such were some of us before Christ transformed us. If you are to forgive as Jesus forgave you, you have to remember that you are far less deserving of his forgiveness than someone else is of yours. And I say that even knowing that these people that may have come to our mind may have done terrible things. When I say that we are far less deserving of of his forgiveness, even if in our eyes the sin of our enemy is greater, how did Christ forgive us? Through what process did he do it? And if you remember, that is his brutal death on the cross. That's a price none of us are ever worthy of. And fortunately, it's a price we don't have to repay. I started out saying that this... Uh, this sermon of Jesus, we could uh, look at it as a way that we should live as, as believers. And it is not a way to live in order to gain salvation. That is only through the grace of God. Um, it is not a way of repaying God for our salvation. We can never repay for him. But what we can do is enter into relationship with him as he draws us and live the way and be changed as he has wanted us to change. So I'll end with, what about this person who hurt me? Love them actively by doing good for them. Pray for them so that perhaps they they will be changed and blessed, but definitely that you will be as well. Bless them with your words. It's healing for you. It's freeing to you. And it's loving God by being obedient to him. Or to paraphrase the words of Jesus, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not love your enemies. Stand as we have our closing hymn.